made me excited about about starting Rocket Dollar was was that there is a better way to do these things, and, and you know, Henry is Mr. Retirement. It's crazy how how much time and how much his career has gone through the space, uh, and and knowing Chris since I was in school uh, was really was really good. So that's that's one of the reasons we landed together. But uh, but yeah, it was it's been a fun story. So I'm excited to tell part of it tonight. <laughs> I got to Austin about 10 years ago. Um, I'm back in a B school. I landed at Google. And at the time, Google only had about 35 or 40 people in Austin. Uh, and we used to kind of be worried that they would at some point just forget that we were here at all. Uh, this was before they had 3,000 people in a gigantic sailboat looking building downtown overlooking the lake. Um, so, uh, and then I, and during that time, uh, eventually, if you stay here long enough, you get interested in what's happening in the startup community. I don't think you can live here and not. Um, and uh, I just I so happened to have worked with uh, another company that, that Thomas was working at, and that's how I met Thomas. The CEO asked me to, to mentor Thomas a little bit, and then Henry and I met doing a deal together. So um, we can probably tell you more about that later. But deal's still going, too. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good news. <laughs> so, um, Henry, maybe you can give us some context around the genesis of Rocket Dollar. What inspired you to start it? And, and really, you know, what was the, the founding story um, prior to deciding to start a company? Yeah, so with Rocket Dollar, uh, as Thomas kind of alluded to, my career has been in a pretty boring space. So when he says, like, I'm sort of Mr. Retirement, it's not as if I was actually ever retired. I just, uh, I spent a lot of time in Austin actually setting up retirement plans for companies. So I was here, I graduated UT kind of right place, right time from my career standpoint, but a pretty bad time then. So when I graduated, the internet bubble was bursting. This was a town, like at the time, uh, Dell was the largest employer, IBM had over 10,000 employees. Um, and all of IBM's buildings are actually now where you guys go to and call it the domain. So just, you know, that's that was literally all of IBM's land and buildings. They kept half of one or something like that and maybe chopped the back half off and sold the rest to become the domain. But um, that, economic turmoil that really hit this city proportionally harder than tech town caused a lot of people at these big companies, big law firms, big accounting firms, big accounting uh, architecture, whatever, to leave and start to throw up their own shingles. And I happened to work at Merrill Lynch. Uh, I could not get wealthy individuals to become clients that you would expect in a recession. But all of these people that had just left their big company jobs needed someone to help them set up a starter retirement plan so they could kick up you know, get two employees to leave IBM and join them a month after they left. So the rest was history for me. I'd set up hundreds of these plans, and that's kind of how Thomas referred to this Mr. Retirement type thing. And then um, I don't know anything else, and this leads into why the Rocket Dollar story. So my thesis became that I know what I know, which is a, this very super narrow field, right? I'm, a, I'm like two miles deep and about half an inch wide. But, um, <laughs> uh, and the the thesis became that, hey, I should look at some other macro trend that I didn't create that I can just see is going to be big. And, and in the time for a rocket dollar, it was actually that people were starting to look at these private deals. That's how I made friends, you know, really close friends, people like Chris. We met actually at a sort of a cocktail get together because this founder in town, Rick Orr, uh, wanted to get all the people that had taken a chance and bet on him as an angel investor. And he realized not everyone knew each other. So he just decided to open up a bar tab. And that's how we met at one of those events. And so that trend was people getting interested in private investments and then obviously with digital currencies um, and thinking that's a huge trend, that's gonna get big. And is there a way that I can overlap this two mile deep like expertise into that trend and then build a business kind of at some intersection of those two things. One I don't control and that's bigger than probably all of us. And then the one little, little limited, limited narrow thing that I actually know. So that's kind of what led to bringing the team together. And, and I'll let Chris talk about how we actually met Thomas uh, through this. Again, I was trying to do a business deal. But, you know, maybe me talking to Chris, it was really that I just kind of found them to be, he didn't mention this, but B School, Google, coming here to Austin, but he's also a military vet uh, as well. And I just he just struck me as this like guy that was like super organized and like just super focused and super smart and just very scientific. And you know, the stuff he'll tell you guys later on will actually be more of like the mechanics of the things that we thought about at the beginning of the company that are really applicable to all startups and business building, because that's kind of what he does, and then keep us all together. Uh, my job is just to, you know, usually wear something or hold something in purple. 
<laughs> so Chris, maybe you can talk about the, the the beginning, right? What was what was that early discussion like? When did the company start? Um, and what made you decide that this was going to be your next move? Yeah, uh, it's a fun story. So uh, a lot of you probably know Brian Bennell, who runs the Austin Tech Happy Hour. It was shut down for a couple years because of COVID, but pr I think we bumped into each other in 2017 at the holiday party. Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen Thomas in a while, and he was in San Antonio slinging similar products, but they were really expensive. There was no tech enablement for a company down there. Uh, I knew about these and said we should talk. We sat down to talk, and then I bumped into Henry, uh, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. There's like, my head was like, there's something interesting happening here. He, he's like, he already knows how to sell these. Henry knows what these are. They're looking for another project. I knew what they were. Uh, and so I got the two of them together. Uh, and it was only a couple of days later. They're like, hey, we're starting a company that's called Rocket Dog. <laughs> <laughs> and I was on the phone with Henry, like, marching around in a bathroom. And he's like, hey, rocketdollar.com is available. I'm like, buy it. He's like, I bought it. Uh, and so, like, well, by February, Rocket Dollar was a thing on paper. Anyway. I was walking outside of my cul de sac, so I wasn't in front of my computer. So he told me to get off the phone, go back inside, yeah, like, buy it. If that <laughs> was it eleven ninety nine, or did you have to? Was it like a private auction? And that was it a was, little pricier. It was being offered for sale for uh, six hundred ninety five dollars. Oh, that's yeah, pretty good. So was yeah. Buy it, yeah, and I was literally marching around the house in a white bathrobe, <laughs> <laughs> like talking on the phone uh, with Henry, um, and then. Initially, uh, and Henry had made a, a, what I thought was a, a, a very wise and mature decision. He said, I'm gonna put someone else on the board, almost as an independent board member right away. And so that was me and there was a role I was gonna play. Uh, I was working at another startup at the time. Uh, but then a few months in, like there was kind of a draw to this. Uh, for one, I thought my skill set could be valuable, but at the same time, like this was something that we had kind of cooked up in a coffee shop. Uh, and there's something really, really appealing about that, right? Um, and so for me, I thought, I, if I was going to do anything in finance, it, this is it. Because it's this, uh, a niche product that I really understood uh, and said, well, we can make this go mainstream. Everybody should have one of these. Uh, and honestly, like, that's part of what drives us. There's everybody, we believe 100 million people should have one of these accounts that would allow you to invest in anything very easily, just like you can buy a stock or bond or a mutual fund. Um, and so that's, a, that's kind of an exciting thing to go pursue. A little crazy, uh, but that's kind of what you want if you're going to go start a business. So Thomas, maybe you can, as the VP of marketing, you can tell us what the traditional way that people are investing is, and then how is Rocket Dollar what the company does? Yeah, how is Rocket Dollar solving this problem with your product? Right. Well, I mean, what the company does is we allow people to invest in alternative assets uh, and keep the benefits of an IRA. Uh, simply, um, the traditional way that that most people will invest for retirement, right, is you go work for a company, you, they set up for you have you participate in a 401k plan, you leave that company, you roll it over to a Fidelity IRA, and you buy stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. And you're limited, and the funds are what they, the funds they let you invest in, the, you know, it's, it's what they tell you you can do. Uh, but within the, the rules of the IRS, uh, they actually only limit you to a certain things that you cannot invest in. Like you can, the IRS actually allows you to invest in, in a ton of different things, including crypto, real estate, startups, Private equity, with, you know, basically anything that's not a collectible, or or something that you have a direct relationship to. That you can't buy a house that your mom owns, for example. Uh, so, so what I've learned in my past position was that there's a certain structure that allows you to do this, uh, but it's paper heavy. It's complicated. It's not, you know, it, people charge you a lot of money for it, and so it's something that's not easy to learn about. There wasn't a ton of content out there about it, and. Uh, and I knew that you know we're in Austin, so this is a tech hub. I knew that there was a tech application to this problem. Um, so that's what we do. We set up we set up an IRA or a type of 401k that allow, allows you to invest in alternative assets, um, and that's basically the big difference. <laughs> so, so the and Henry, um, you you find these gentlemen. You decide you're going to start the company. You buy the domain name. What are the next steps? Because in a financial services business, I'm guessing that there is compliance as, as one barrier to entry or being able to legally provide these services. Yeah. And then obviously building a software business is expensive. So how do you get things off the ground? Um, well, so we decided, now this is where, I wanted to talk, we talked about this before, Joe, but <clears throat> to be constructive for people, right? Just things that are applicable beyond rocket dollars, because that's the whole reason Started Grind exists. That's the reason why you know Damon 
you know, does what he does for the community and is a huge advocate uh, in Austin and beyond. I mean, everyone knows who he is. But um, so one of the applicable things, the thing I liked about fintech businesses, and that's a term that's very broad now, but I love these types of fintech businesses because I kind of thought that the compliance and the regulation around when you're dealing with people's money is a little bit of a natural moat. So it made it harder for just anybody to get into the business. So that's that was one thing I liked. It, it presented this sort of natural moat. Um, and then, you know, on the compliance side of the software, so here's the real reason, but we uh, employed attorneys early just to kind of say, hey, what do we need to do from a trademark standpoint? They said, you know, you need to get someone that's not one of your 25 closest friends in the world to buy a product from you, and then you can sort of start to file to protect the name. So we threw up a website so someone can open an account, uh, just go through the onboarding, even though it was all manual uh, on the back end, just so we could start the process of protecting you know, Rocket Dollar as a name and sort of getting to that. And then the name of the company itself, so thinking of it, the domain was one thing, but the other is it was just there, it was a way to signify that, hey, you could do, do things that you normally can't do with your money, you can go further and farther. Obviously, Rocket kind of signified that. And uh, remember, this was 2018, so I mean, I didn't know at the time that the two richest people in the world were gonna start competing to fly themselves into space, right? Because it wasn't enough that they were running Amazon and Tesla and SpaceX. They all just needed to actually fly themselves and their friends to space. So Rocket kind of became, and space became this very cool thing, but it was really just to signify go further farther with money. And getting the software up, I mean, remember, simplicity is another key. We were able to pitch our business through whatever, seed round, uh, seed extension in the Series A without using any buzzwords in any of the pitches. I remember actually using that in these pitches, saying that, look, there's no random buzzwords like quantum AI, machine learning, none of that. I mean, this is a technology-enabled workflow. The greatest startups that I know about can usually be explained in one sentence by a 10-year-old. Uber, you know, like, you can explain what they do in one sentence, Robin Hood, right? Easy, I mean, to maybe a different extent like we were, which, you know, who knows ultimately, but, Extending the consciousness throughout the world is not the other Raising the consciousness. When they're a real estate company, very simple to understand. But the whole point was that that's how people got it. Like, you, you took all the buzzwords and stuff away. What we built was a technology enabled workflow to enable this formally complex and expensive capability to be made available to a broader group of the population. And then the bet would be that people either should have it or they're going to want to have it. And that, that was against that thesis that. There's going to be a lot of people in the world that are going to want to buy alternative assets, real estate, investment, private funds, private companies that their friends started, and then uh, in another way altogether that was separate from us again, digital currency. So, so initially, I mean, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but none of you are programmers by trade, right? So, what was building the MVP like? I know you had mentioned that you know you're putting up almost like type form, right? That you can manually do stuff on the back end, but what was building the MVP like just to, to get early traction, start protecting the name, and actually have a business running? Yeah, so there's a couple different things that happened. So we did have a, uh, another co-founder who did have something of a technical background. Uh, so he was heavily involved in getting sort of the first version of the app up and running, and we hired a developer, a young guy, 20 years old at the time, right? 19. 19, 19 when we hired him straight, basically straight out of high school. He's like, I got to be college, I'm going to go write code and run his own. Um, and he did. And he I met him when he was 16. Yeah, and, he's, <laughs> and, and, he, and Henry has that sort of track record of knowing people for a very long time and then you know, they want to work together at some point. But he's still with us today. That developer or engineer is still with us today in a, in a key engineering role for us. But you don't need all that to get started. Uh, so if you think about it, the great businesses are very simple. They're just doing something really complex very simply. And so we could put up a brochureware website that was call us for a solo 401k, and we put a phone number up there, and the first phone number was, I think, mine. Uh, and then eventually we put this first sales guy, Dan, his phone number up there, and people call. Uh, and then at South By, we hired a, we hire a, a guy dressed up in an astronaut suit to run around and hand out business cards and coupon codes. And, we spent more um, money to rent the astronaut suit. <laughs> 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 and so we did this you know, quasi-soft launch at South By. Um, and so the, the 2018, 2018. Oh, yeah. wow, okay. And then so the, these things worked. I mean, people were calling in, like we were opening accounts. And at the time, there was no software behind it. And so we had little yellow stickies that we put on the window. 
uh, and like step one, step two, step three, and then like, okay, get the paperwork, we'll get the name, put a little code out, move the sticky, like it was a workflow manager. Uh, and then like literally the process of moving stickies out the window became the first set of requirements that the developer used to start building you know, the core application that on some level like still exists today, of course a lot more robust today. Uh, but we, you can get started that way. What we wanted to really validate was the hypothesis that, or the, the, our best guess, that if this was a lot easier, more people would do it. Uh, and that this is a very interesting customer base. And our first like 10 or 20 customers were, I mean something like half of them had an advanced degree. So this is a very, very unique customer base. These folks are, even still today, they age between 35 and 55. They live in Tony zip codes. Uh, they have six-figure income, six or seven, high six or seven-figure net worths. So this is a very interesting crowd um, and a, a very desirable customer. Um, and we got started selling to them with literally just a brochure by web page. Um, and so then you know, the developers eventually built the first version of the application. And then over time, um, you, you, just, you just add to it. Uh, you start listening to people about what they want and what they need, listen to the feedback. The feedback comes in over the phone, it comes in through customer service tickets, um, it comes in from uh, virtually everywhere. You know, us having conversations with people here who might have an account. Um, and so then over time, the app gets better and better. Um, today, uh, the way other entrepreneurs could do that, there are volumes of now of these low code or no code application development tools. You don't need to be a programmer anymore. Now, if you're going to go and build, like, you want to build, like, the world's greatest app for something, at some point you've got to go hire professional developers, sure, or find a CTO and go that path. But you can get started, and you can certainly start testing concepts without any coding experience at all. What was the the inflection point when you knew that you you had something? Obviously, you know, there's Henry and, and Thomas. You both have experience in the space, so. From your perspective, Henry, I think when you decided to start the company, you knew there was something there. But what was the tipping point at which all of you were working on full time, the team started to grow, and potentially even you know you raised some early funds to, to really go after this thing? Yeah, I'll tell you mine too, and then I want to hear theirs because I actually don't know what they're going to say. There were two. Uh, we pitched CTAN here locally, which is the Central Texas Angel Network, uh, still up and running and a great organization. And a little woman raised her hand to ask us a question during the Q and A, and she said, "Out of all the accounts that you have, we had like what 80 at the time, or 100 some, maybe yeah. I don't know the exact number. <coughs> How many of them do you two not know personally?" <laughs> <laughs> and and like by then, like we didn't know most of them. Like there was somebody who bought an account that day in North Dakota. I don't know anybody in North Dakota. I'm from New York. I live in Texas. Uh, and so like, no, there are people actually buying this that we don't know. And that's a really good sign. Uh, so that was one. And the second one was uh, we have a customer. Uh, who actually became an investor later on, the UPS pilot. Uh, and he opened an account with us early on, um, and he put, you know, like 50, 60 grand in to get started, and then like a couple weeks later, it calls my cell phone. Remember at one point, the cell, my cell phone was not the website. Uh, it says I want to roll over another 300 grand. And I was like, 300 grand? I almost <laughs> dropped my phone. I'm like, that's a pile of money. We got something. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I mean, so I I was day one when Henry and I, Henry and I met on like January twentieth, twenty eighteen, something like that. It was late January. I remember we canceled our first meeting because it was a snow day, so we had to stay home with the daughters. But then we met the next day, and that's basically. And I'm day, in Texas. I can't drive in the snow. Right, right. <laughs> snow yeah. And uh, and so from that day on, I was basically on full. I mean, it, from from January twentieth when we met, we sold our first account in March. Uh, so it was it was a blur. Uh, and and I knew that this was something that we could sell because I've done it, but the first time that I was like, whoa, was when an account came in through the website of, when we looked at the name, it was like, does anybody know who this is? Did anybody talk to them? And it was like, no, I don't know who that is, I don't know. It's like, somebody just bought a retirement account from us and they never talked to us? Well, if we could do that once on the internet, we could do that 10,000 times. Like, there's a way to do it. So that was my big one. But yeah, it was day one. We were we were full time, and it was it's been four and a half years almost. Yeah, we we can talk and get into more of the details, but we did. Um, so my last company was just was right out of the gate VC backed uh, seed round, you know, based on an idea. We didn't have anything. So this one, a little bit different track. I mean, at that point had more of a network, uh, had. A 
prior startup. And our initial round, we did a we did a commercial note round, so it's pretty known here in town. And we did that for a million and a half dollars. And a lot of those were people that Chris and I did know uh, through the community. So and then us. And we're also some customers as well at that point. No, we didn't have uh, the, the product like they maybe became customers, but we just introduced the concept. And you know, it's kind of known here in town that you know you invest in someone's startup, and they invest in yours, kind of thing. And they don't. Uh, they purposely, they're betting on the person, right? It's usually early stage. They always tell you, you're betting on the person, you're not betting on the business, and, and most people didn't. Uh, remember, we're in retirement accounts, and if my nickname is Thomas and Mr. Retirement, this is not very interesting, right? This is no buzzword, <laughs> this is not cool, this isn't flying cars or anything like that. Um, but, you know, for me, I don't, I don't know if there's any one inflection point. I guess I was just really determined that I wanted to start something, and I really thought that, hey, we're a team that actually is the best equipped group of people in the world to deliver this product. Like we're here so we can get the support of this community, right? Really investors with a lot of individuals. We knew the space. Um, and I just thought that this is the right space. Like in other words, we should build this product because the world deserves this product. So that was kind of what drove me. Like I think that you, you may, you guys may or may not know, but um, there's roughly about 17 to 20,000 registered mutual funds in the US, but there's only 4,000 publicly traded companies. So it may seem like it's a lot of choice, but it's a lot of choice within their guardrails at the top 10 financial services companies. So I really just thought that that's not the way things should be. You know, people should have the freedom, their money, uh, to get, get great tax treatment, long time horizon in these IRA accounts, and then there's a lot of capital needs for private businesses, infrastructure, real estate, you know, maybe cryptocurrencies, you name it. Um, and we can tap into that. So let me tell you real quick the market, and then we can kind of keep going on. But the realization for me wasn't an inflection point after we started the business, was that there is $33 trillion sitting in retirement accounts in the US. 14 trillion of it sitting in uh, IRAs, another eight sitting in 401ks. The rest are you know, sort of corporate pensions. But let's just say that that market, that is a massive amount of capital that can then be redistributed into angel investments, crowdfunding campaigns, you know, LPs into emerging manager funds, uh, cryptocurrencies, you know, capital factory funds, for example, that is literally sitting uh, spread out in 20,000 different packaged products among 4,000 of the same companies. And I just thought that th this would be this would be a huge opportunity if we did this right. It also seems like a business is extremely sticky. Right, so like when someone decides they want to work with Rocket Dollar, I'm guessing that the churn wouldn't be as high as other service businesses. Is that right? Well, so that was my design too. So again, you learn right things that are applicable. I mean, you want to look at there's inputs that go into that, that sort of magical. Everyone hears the term LTV, uh, lifetime value customer. Uh, one of the inputs that people don't talk about as much is actually the tenure or how long you keep that customer and the amount that you could produce churn. So people that don't cancel your services, right? This is a big thing in subscription businesses for streaming services. People sign up for the subscription on a free trial, binge watch their favorite show, and then never sign up to become a customer. Or they sign up long enough, the season ends, and then they cancel until the next season, for example. Well, the thought process for us was that we're letting people buy into private, alternative, completely illiquid investments using an account that you can't take any money out of until you're over 59 and a half. So those two factors combined actually created a really sticky customer, not because uh, we did this sort of like jerk tech method of making it hard for them to cancel, but more that they proactively chose to get into a long-term vehicle in a long-term account type. And then we can build off of that. So that's, you know, when Chris gets excited, like we get these accounts with 300,000, 500,000, we're thinking that, hey, this is 300,000 they chose to give to us. We're probably only gonna get five to 10% of their investable monies an IRA that they want to go into a private investment, this person could have two and a half million more. They're a customer for 10 years. So now, uh, and, and this is the chief operating officer's job, right? What are the other things that you're going to build or the team can build to sell them? Because we have 10 years with these people. We, could, we should be able to multiply the amount of money that we make off them over time if we do this right. We're still early, so we're talking to you in this early phase, but that's the thinking and mentality on this part. Yeah, it is still really early. And you know, a lot of startups are notorious for pivoting until you find product market fit, uh, both with product offering and with the pricing. Can you touch on the initial product and pricing offering and if that has changed at all along the way? 
So a couple things. We started with just the, the one person 401k plan. Um, and remember, we had that brochure work page with a phone number on it. People were calling it and also asking, well, hey, can you do an IRA too? This is where you have to listen. Uh, and so I think we, we had a sales guy named Dan with us at the time. You guys all know Dan Krasinowski. Yeah, he's younger, remember? Yeah, Dan. Yeah. 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 Dan. Don't Dan. Yeah. It's yeah. still on the site. So, so <laughs> it's probably still up there somewhere. Uh, every time someone would ask for an IRA, Dan would make a tick mark on the window with a marker. Right. And once there was a bunch of tick marks, we were like, that's the new product. And the, these guys all came in one morning and they're like, we're building an IRA. I'm like, awesome. <laughs> uh, and so uh, we haven't steered very far from that. Uh, and remember, this market existed before we got into it. So we knew that there was a space for this. Again, we were testing whether or not a tech-enabled version of this would make it faster, make it better, make it easier, bring more people into the fold, let this thing eventually go mainstream, and then to Henry's point, can we sell them other things? Um, and then on the pricing, so a couple things. Um, we fundamentally believe that there is a shift happening in finance, and then if, and me personally, and in other sectors, where anything that can look and function like a subscription will probably go. Or uh, the pricing and finance and in banking and in general fintech will look more like consumer products than the typical fee sheet you used to get from a bank. Uh, you're a little younger than us or than me, but like, first time I ever went in to open a bank account, they give you a folder this big uh, with pricing. It looks like the menu at the Cheesecake Factory, right? It's like, <laughs> there's like 10,000 things on it and the bank makes money on every little thing that you do or don't do. Um, and so we thought, why not just make this, a, and, and to Henry's credit and Thomas, they launched this before I even come full time um, and had it in a pitch deck ready to go with a subscription price. And so we've, uh, we've used that since, um, and that's part of how, uh, to some extent, and maybe even not initially our intent, we ended up gating and having just this really awesome customer base uh, because you have a really big account, it makes sense for you to come to us because you'll pay a little bit less than if you were somewhere else. Uh, and really, really smart people think with their pocketbook. Uh, and so we have a really, really great customer base as a result of that. So uh, on some level, that's that's working. It's been working since day one. And frankly, we haven't messed with it. Uh, we did add an additional service tier. Like I just saw an ad for American Express on that TV. Uh, and American Express was kind of an inspiration for us. So the second version of the product really was an enhanced level of service that we call Rocket Dollar Gold. Uh, and so we charge more for that. We charge twice as much um, in the subscription. Um, and what was cool about that was we initially thought, you know, 9 or 10% of people will buy the gold product. And that's what we had forecasted and modeled out. It's like a third, sometimes 40%, sometimes more of the sales. Um, and so that means there might even be like, you know, maybe a platinum or maybe a palladium option later on, but uh, we're thinking about those things. But that's something that worked out really, really well for us. And so the pricing has remained the same since day one, but as, uh, in minus the additional tier, that's right. like the entry level. And what is this, $360? And then 15 a month. And then 15 bucks a month. Or 630 Okay, got it. And then is the subscription and the initiation fee how Rocket Dollar makes money? Or is there like a further value of if I have $100 million, <laughs> me being a rock, Rocket Dollar customer? Yes, today that's how we make money. Um, and then we have other agreements now with financial partners so that as the business grows, uh, there can be some uh, other revenue opportunities for us. Got it. Uh, but as of today, uh, we're still primarily focused on that. And then we have, of course, a much lengthier plan that we're using the Series A funds for. Uh, which will get us into uh, a couple of other things later on down the road where we can monetize with investments and other options. Amazing. Uh, Thomas, let's talk about customer acquisition. So, right, early on, 2018, going out and getting your first hundred or couple hundred customers was probably a different process in starting to scale the business. So, can you talk about turning the levers on and how you started to scale the, the acquisition side of, of Rocket Dollar? Yeah, I mean, at its core, it's been the same since day one. Uh, this is a cool thing that most people have never heard of uh, that they didn't know they could do. So, whether it's in person, one on one for the first 100 or 200, or whether it's you know 100 at a time, it's always, and our focus has always been on education and providing content that makes it easy for people to learn what the possibilities are. So it's always been uh, 
you know, how can we create and provide educational content that people will interact with and then decide that this is something that they want to do. Uh, and so all of our you know, typical digital marketing strategies, whether it's Google or Facebook or whatever, uh, or one-on-one -on -one has always been geared around education. And that's kind of the way that we've always sold. Uh, we've never really you know, employed any sort of hard sell tactics or any sort of, uh, you know, gotchas or whatever. No door to door in gated neighborhoods? No, no, I mean, not, nothing like that because um, one, we wanted people to be happy with what they purchased. I mean, it's a big decision for a lot of people. And we wanted them to know what they were getting into and, and feel empowered and feel confident uh, in what they were doing. And so so it's really whether, like I said, one-on-one -on -one or, or you know, distributing content uh, around the country, uh, it's always been about education. And if you provide that, people will trust you, they'll respect you, and they'll want to And what is the, would you say, like the customer profile? Age-wise, you know, I know we had talked about kind of income and net worth levels, but what is like the prime customer? And as your company grows, does that customer profile expand or change at all? Uh, well, yeah, so our, our customer today, like Chris alluded to earlier, is, is between 35 and 50, uh, typically. Um, they've had a couple of years, years to accumulate some assets in a retirement account to the point where this makes sense uh, for them. And and really what they what they all want, that what they all have in common is that they all want access to other things. They want to control their money. It's that they've earned, that they've worked hard for, um, and they want to do other things with it. They don't want to be locked in to like one of these mutual funds or something like that. Um, so that's that's kind of our core, and we call them, we call them mice <laughs> internally. That's always been, you know, we, we took a day early on to create this custom profile. We went through a questionnaire and we, we built our sort of uh, core customer. And the reality is it makes it really easy because I work with him every day, but like Chris Palmisano is like our ideal customer. Um, he's had a really good picture on the window. <laughs> <laughs> well, my my middle name was Michael. <laughs> so that's uh, partly where it came from. But yeah, it's, it's someone that has had a successful career, um, has had time to accumulate assets in a retirement account. Because at the end of the day, the way it's priced right now, if you're 22 and you contribute, you know, five or six thousand dollars to an IRA, it, it's really not uh, priced in a way that makes sense uh, for, for that person, and and that's okay. Uh, so that's that's our customer today, and absolutely, I mean, we there, there's an explosion of, of alternative investments that are that are not f for accredited investors. That's always been a, a big thing in this space, uh, and different asset classes, cryptocurrencies. That, that we're very excited about and building products to sort of uh, push the edges of, of our demographic uh, age range really and uh, and build product for those people so that anybody that wants access to something else can get it. It's not just people that have had the time to accumulate assets to where this makes sense. Got it. Well, and I have a thought on that too. So yeah. there's a strategy, so you asked like if that might change. So we are designing products and we're gonna come to make the product more broadly available to a bigger group of people. So that would be, let's say, younger, less affluent. And a lot of companies in FinTech, they actually start the opposite direction, right? A lot of them are built on basically giving access to previously inaccessible investments, like professional portfolio management, if you use Betterment or Wealthfront, uh, individual stock trading, if it's Robinhood. You know, you used to not be able to do that with just $5, right? You can do it at Robinhood. And so they start in Chime. Chime was banking services that were that were made available in a simple mobile app for many people that wouldn't get treated very well if they walked into the Chase Branch in downtown Austin at 221 West 6th, right? Um, so we actually thought that that's really crowded, that's hard for us to do that. We don't have the money to compete that way and just go after massive growth at unit economic losses from day one. So we talked about this, that we actually did kind of the Tesla model, which is you start super high end, right? Uh, most people don't remember, but before Tesla became mainstream, they sold they basically put their battery technology inside of Lotus uh, sports roadsters, right? Those cars were like $250,000 at starting, and then oddly enough, because Tesla is Tesla, now those cars are worth even more because of collector's items. Then they start coming down. Now the Model 3 makes it available to a much larger, broader group. So we want to do that. Where we're starting in that upper right quadrant with a somewhat, let's say, affluent or uh, you know, very attractive consumer demographic, and then build the products that now may be capable and accessible from a much broader set of the public. That's how we want to go. We can, it's less crowded for us to go top down than from bottom up. Because bottom up is, hey, I need a $20 million you know, A round. I'm 
want to that allows me to buy X amount of digital marketing, I should be able to get X number of customers. Now, if those customers won't pay me, then I want to figure out some way to monetize it later. And I don't know, maybe I'm old, but I define a customer as someone who pays <laughs> for something, and then I give them something in return. That's the definition of a customer. I think they're confusing the word user with customer. <laughs> customer yeah. is someone who pays, user is someone who has the product. There's a big difference in business, unless, you know, we're in Austin, right? We're not Silicon Valley, so it's not easy to get a $20 million round on a big deck. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. That's basically what the whole point of building a business maybe here and in the style that we did versus maybe a style that is accepted or known in a different era and a different part of the country. Yeah, I think the strategy makes a lot of sense, and it sounds exciting internally knowing that <laughs> not only is the customer expanding, but the product offering can expand along with them. Um, Everything up until this point sounds amazing, but obviously building startups is extremely difficult, mm -hmm. and there's hard times too. So I wanna I wanna pivot to talk a little bit about kind of two pieces. One is exit velocity, right, and and going after a Series A round to increase the growth of the company, um, and two are some of the challenges that you faced along the way, and, and maybe those happened in parallel with each other. Yeah, well, you know, it was tough, obviously. There was a lot of changes in the world and the business, so we used to have a full-time office, so we subleased in a company that was an angel investor in 800 Brothels was our first office. Our corporation paid for it, um, you know, has that as the address still. And then we ended up taking over as a sublease of a space in the, behind that parking garage. There was a four-story building there, so that's where we moved to. And then right as that lease was coming to the end, that's when the pandemic started with Chris, um, sent everyone home. But there were a lot of times in there where uh, just said, hey, just stop coming to the office and then we'll get all your crap back to you. So I remember he and I were actually up here putting everyone's stuff up, to, you know, meeting up with them individually to get their stuff back. Like, that this would have been in March of, of 2020. But, you know, the, the raising money wasn't easy for us. I mean, this was kind of a little bit of an unknown concept. It, uh, we wanted to do it our way. I mean, I, I don't know. I think the way that we're coming across in this communication today is that these guys are really damn stubborn. Like they didn't change their pricing, they didn't fix their product. The story has stayed basically the same. Um, but there were a lot of people that told us to do things differently, and that would have made it more attractive to them from a potential investment standpoint. But again, these are the opinions of people who don't like you know go to work in the trenches every day. They get to swoop in and give their like you know expert opinion, and then be out of there. It's one thing if they wrote the check and said that that's the condition, but we had you know up and down times where. Uh, you know, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to sustain it. Like, you know, I, I think my main thing I always remember thinking, and I've heard Fred Hurd say this before, like, if you're the CEO, your job is to kind of maintain uh, kind of the team culture and then make sure there's cash in the bank. It's like, you know, then everyone else has their roles, but you, the CEO, those might be your primary things for a very big part of the earlier part of that company is make sure that you don't run out of money. Uh, keep executing, keep iterating on those goals, but uh, we were always dangerously close at different times including the Series A. And when we ultimately got a chance to raise that round, you know, we made the decision to kind of take a round that we thought fit us to get to the next point, the, what we sold, what we executed to, and didn't take any more or any less than that amount. We were offered more. Um, and oddly enough, the only story that uh, from the TechCrunch wanted to write was to write about why we took less than we were offering. They didn't want to write anything about the company. They just found out that we were one of four companies that this uh, reporter for them was researching, and that's what she wanted to write about. We didn't have to do that story, but. So you raised at the end of 21, is that right? So yeah. can you talk a little bit about the dynamics of the, of the A? Yeah, so again, this is probably a situation where it's better to be lucky than good, but uh, we're in May, so May of 2021. Uh, you guys may or may not know, but May is designated as Asian American Pacific Islander. Heritage Month. So we, like we always have done, and send out our regular updates, and we were going down a certain path with a different group of investors, but that investor update that we sent out uh, at that time, uh, Labor Day, or Memorial Day, ended up getting forwarded to a syndication group of Asian American founders and, and sort of investors, and they called me and asked if they could be a part of the round. And then what happened was when they wrote the memo to syndicate to collect $400,000 through this you know, very specific group that backed uh, an Asian American founded company. <coughs> One of the people on that list actually asked to be contacted, put in contact with us directly, and made a 
counteroffer to the one we had. Uh, better offer, better terms, like <coughs> you know, uh, better being control in our hands in terms of how we continue the business to the next day. So we took that. But this process went from May to ultimate close in uh, late August of 2021. So that's what we're operating off of now. But again, everything, the path that we were going down completely changed, you know, just in that sort of 30, 60 days and went down a different path, whole new group of investors. So that ended up leading to getting our lead investors, uh, a, a group called Park West Asset Management, getting a strategic investor from the crypto exchange in Kraken, and then rounding that out with a new firm for VC legend Alan Patrickoff and his co-founder Abby Levy. So that's kind of how the round shaped up for us. And that those are people that you know we had a chance since to introduce them to each other, and that's what we're operating off of. So now they're in the trenches with us, um, and they're okay with us being somewhat stubborn as we're coming across right now. <laughs> <laughs> and so, how has the company changed or evolved since raising an A round? Both, I guess. Uh, vision-wise, as far as your goals as a company, and then maybe you know uh, culture and and, and team-wise. Yeah, so I'll just give the quick nuts and bolts and see if either you know, of these guys want to chime in. But so the nuts and bolts are that um, we really wanted to fill out the engineering and product team. So I thought the advantage that we had over other startups, and this is other parts of the country, uh, our advantage wasn't money, right? I mean, eight million dollar Series A round in fintech actually seemed kind of small in twenty. We had competitors and other people in the fintech space that were raising like 10, 50, 100 million dollar A rounds in 2021. Uh, we didn't, but I thought the one advantage we had was we had longevity in the city, and we knew that we needed to now really refactor and make sure that the foundational tech was built to last and built to be, you know, integratable. If we were to eventually, right, there's only two, three ways to exit the company: bankruptcy, so acquisition, or IPO. Um, so two of those three are good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you guess which one is not a good one. Um, and we just thought that, hey, we've got to make sure that we're ready for that. So there were things that we did operationally to make sure we're ready, but then things we, things we need to do team-wise. And the longevity in the city let it put us in a position where I was confident that we can go back and tap past networks and get people to basically join us. That's to Chris's point. I mean, probably even today at 27 people, I would say that more than... 14 of them, I've known for longer than this company's existed now. Uh, you know, somewhere in that range. It's a pretty high number uh, and so forth, but pretty proud of that. And then we knew that we could staff up when everyone else is saying, oh, it's impossible to hire people. You know, they don't want to come to the office. They don't want to get paid $2 million a year you know, so they can afford a house in Austin. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's about the ratio right now, right? So, um, and are you still hiring? And if so, what, what type of roles? Yeah, so we kind of did that. We wanted the front load. So we told our Series A investors that we would front load that in the first half of this year. So we're actually in a pretty good spot right now, especially with some recent hires, a couple of which are here with us today, um, because we wanted to make sure that they could get up to speed to be sort of relevant and contributing in the second half of the year, which is when we really need to execute as a business on the Series A dollars and leading into the process for the Series B round of the company, if that's the next stage for us, right? That's not the only way, but that's probably maybe the expected way. That's 70% uh, the expectation would be go towards this path. But I would say that we're pretty, you know, kind of filled out at this point, but purposely so. We did what would have taken us all in 2022. We tried to do it in the first, you know, 100, 120 days of this year. Yeah. Otherwise, they're still going to be learning the job. So, um, obviously, the last 60, 90 days or so have been a crazy time in the market. So can you talk about how the company, in a, a financial services company, is affected in a, mar a market downturn like we're currently seeing? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so a couple things. Uh, the first one is it's going to impact everybody differently, but in our business, uh, yeah, you, you, you do have to deal with it. And so people uh, behave differently, and so like there's there's a number of things that happen on the calendar. So there's the new year trickles over, then there's tax season. Retirement accounts are generally used for tax planning purposes also. And so there's spikes in volume, and then maybe the volume slows down for a little bit. And then when there are big shocks to the system at the macro level, uh, they are sometimes felt down at the micro level, so where we operate as a company. Uh, and so we'll, we'll see things like as, as crypto goes down, there's less accounts or less interest in crypto for a short period of time. 
Uh, these things usually always come back, and so there is some cyclicality to it. Um, we don't have any concerns, uh, but you just have to hold on tight uh, and uh, just keep, stay focused on the long haul here um, and uh, continue to operate your business and, and, and keep delivering value, and, uh, and things will work out you know, sort of in the end. So uh, it, it, is, it can be entertaining to watch, too. Uh, you know, we, we, we diagnose the things that have happened in the previous day in our morning stand-ups or our morning calls. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting things happening right now. Um, you know, Elon buying Twitter. Uh, what, uh, the, the run on Luna last night uh, in the crypto sphere. Um, so these things are actually kind of fascinating to watch. Um, but uh, is it something that's going to, you know, hurt us in the long run? I don't think so. Well, and I almost might want to add just that I don't know that you're necessarily focused on that, right? I mean, anything, you look back in history, the greatest companies were usually you know, developed during tougher times economically, um, and maybe this is kind of a good thing. I mean, for us, we just tune that out. We have, we have our cash, we have our runway, we have our approved budget uh, amongst our team and with the board, so we know what the plan is, we know what the expected expenses are, we know what the expected forecasts are. Um, these are the things that, you, you know, you do, you start to professionalize the company, so now we have a forecast model. Budget, budget based model, aggressive, uh, you, you know, downside case. And all those have different sort of uh, expenses and different maybe capital needs. But, you know, for us, we're, we're good from a capital standpoint. So we shouldn't really worry so much about what's happening in the markets. And I think that, you know, for us, if and when we're ready to go tap and run that process for the next round, I kind of view that maybe a pullback in this actually allocates more capital to the companies that were able to sustain themselves and be great. Um, you look at some of the, the big, big startups of today, a lot of them actually did start in that sort of like 2007, 8, 9, 10 time frame, and they're the household names that you know today.
And I think the end of my professorial head not here. <laughs> but I think the answer to that is you have to separate who you are from what you do. And they call this your identity versus the roles that you play. Uh, and I'm a COO, Thomas is the head of marketing, Henry's the founder and the CEO. Those are roles. They are not who these guys are on a day-to-day -day basis. They are people. Uh, they have their own self-worth, self-esteem, values. They are uh, independent and integrated men, right? Uh, we all are. And then what we do at the, at the job is, is a role. We're playing a role. Uh, and if you can separate the two, you can continue to build one so that you can take the negative feedback that comes in on a day-to-day -day basis about your role. Uh, and even if you're doing a great job, we're going to get some bad, we're going to have customers that aren't going to have a great experience in that. Uh, markets are down. Uh, investors are telling us to pound sand. <laughs> and so you can handle that because you're strong in who you are at your core. Uh, and so I think if you can separate the two, the easy way to say this is you are not what you do. Uh, and make sure that there's a healthy line between the two. Um, and it comes from identity role theory. Uh, and so the, that's, how you, that's how you do it. How, how did you learn that initially before? Yeah, uh, very, very good sales training. Um, I had a sales job, my first sales job, I was in a BD role prior to that, but I went into a, like a no kidding, quota carrying sales job at Google, and uh, I paid for the sales training on my own, and then eventually my boss was like, yeah, this stuff's really good, and then they started paying for it, and so I worked with a sales coach for a year, um, may he rest in peace, he used to live here in Austin, and he uh, passed away during COVID, but a fabulous guy, and uh, the material got really deep into the psychology of selling and sales. Um, and it can be a brutal profession. This is why you meet people, all kinds of people in their late 20s because they started out and they got a sales job and it didn't work. And they're like, I gotta go back to school and I gotta land somewhere and do something else. Uh, it happens all the time. I would spend days in the bowels of Google interviewing candidates and I would hear the story over and over and over again. Um, and then when you learn to do this, you can take that with you into other areas of your life. Um, and You'd be surprised how often you're selling. Uh, there's really fascinating research from a guy named Daniel Pink. You know, he wrote um, a number of really famous books, but one of them was about actually selling. Um, and uh, most of us knowledge workers spend somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of the day using the typical skills that a salesperson uses 100 percent of the time. So that's you negotiating, that's you trying to influence someone, that's you trying to carry on a conversation and communicate persuasively or effectively. Uh, so when you think about it, whether or not you know it, you're all in sales. Uh, and to some level, you're all in sales. Every founder is absolutely in sales. Uh, I mean, ask him what it was like to go out and pitch all those firms. Like, that's the sale. Um, and so anyways, uh, that's where that came from. But I think that's what you gotta do. You separate who you are from what you do, um, and that's gonna allow you to get very, very good at what you do without having it taken down. Something tells me that you put the professorial hat on quite often. Is that right? <laughs> well, I, I, I used to teach the same. Fits you well. Yeah. So two two topics that I want to um, go over before we open it up to Q and A here. One is Austin, Texas. Right. Um, we talked about how the dynamics of work have changed, you know, since the pandemic. Um, maybe you can talk about. Austin as a headquarter for a software and a financial services company, how it stacks up pros and cons, uh, and also how your work environment, you know, being um, going from having an office to being more remote based has benefited the company. Yeah, I'll start. Um, so a couple things on like Austin comparatively, uh, even Sequoia is probably the best venture capital firm on the planet, has come out and said that you can do this anywhere. Uh, so um, for them, to, this is the, the Silicon Valley stalwart. For them to go ahead and say you can do this anywhere now is kind of the seal of approval for us all to go start companies wherever we want. Um, and we're going to do it here in Austin because that's where we live and this is where we want to do this. Um, but uh, you can, you, frankly, now you can do this anywhere. So there's no reason you can't do it in Austin. And then given what's, given Austin's growth and who's here now and the new people that are here and the new money that's here, uh, there are all kinds of venture capital firms and investors here that were not here two years ago or three years ago. Uh, and so the landscape here has changed considerably. I think it's all in the long run going to be a good thing. Um, there will bring some additional tension. Uh, so housing prices for one, and you know, it's, it seems like it's getting 
rather difficult to get into certain restaurants, and you know, it's just it's just crowded. There's just a lot of people here now that weren't here before. But I, I think this is a great place for us comparatively. Um, could we be doing this in the Valley or in New York? Sure, but we're only a short flight from New York, uh, and uh, we're pretty well connected out there. So I think we'll be able to get what we need. Uh, and then on the office thing, that was May of no March. I'm sorry, March of 20 when we sent everybody home. And it's not better or worse. It's just different. And I think you get used to it. Um, we are mostly, well, completely distributed. Uh, one of the things that we do that I like is every employee can go to where we work. So we work on demand, it's inexpensive. So you gotta get out of the house, or you gotta have a team meeting, or you got uh, employees coming into town, just go get a space for the day. Uh, so I think where we land, kind of the macro level, is companies figure out when do I need my people in the same place, and when do I not? And what is the rotation? and what activities are better in person, um, and then do those things and follow the best practices. And so maybe that's two days a week in the, at, at home, and maybe that's one day Friday, so you can enter the week and exit the week in your home office, uh, and maybe that helps people have a better home life. But Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, when you've got to do your deepest thinking, or when you're doing really intense collaborative work, or you're really getting deep, doing deep work, maybe you do that when you're in the office or at, or at the office, the shared office with your team members. Um, so companies will have to figure that out. It'll be different for certain roles and certain functions and certain industries. Um, but over time, I, I think we'll get it right. Because remember, the people that are in charge at big companies today, are, are they're, they're older than me and I. Um, and so they grew up in business where everyone had to be in butts and seats, and that's even the phrase they use, all the time. So this idea that everybody's gonna work from home is like, that's why they're having this debate with the great, what are they calling it, the great resignation, and people are leaving, and younger folks are leaving in droves, because they're like, I'm not gonna work from the building every day. Some famous AI researcher just left Google, uh, or Apple, one of the one of the two, because he was like, no, my team can do this remotely, uh, and I don't wanna come back to the office. And so companies will settle on what works best for them. Yeah, and go, so going back to the Austin thing, I, I, I landed in Austin to go to school. Um, and I fell in love with the city. I, I loved going to UT. I thought it was a fantastic school, but I loved everything around UT. And so pretty early on, I made the decision that I was gonna do my best to stay in, in, in town uh, and do whatever, work for whoever would hire me. And just I just wanted to be here. I thought that I'd been in Capital Factory a couple times when I was in college and I thought it had like really, really fun energy and motivated people and it was exciting and I wanted to be a part of that. Uh, and so I made the decision to stay. And then, and then, you know, I'm here now, uh, and I, I have no plans to leave. Uh, and for me, my experience with with COVID in, in March of 2020 was, uh, I live alone and I live by myself. And so for me, it was really easy. I had a quiet space to work every day, and I didn't have to deal with a lot of the things that a lot of people had to deal with, like kids and pets and spouses and all these things that that a lot of people did have to deal with that, that was difficult. Uh, so I, I actually found myself being more productive because I'm the talker of the group and so I would spend half my day in the office going around talking to everybody and so all of a sudden I found myself in an apartment uh, with no one to talk to and I became really productive. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so for me, uh, working from home was, was really a, a net positive. But like Chris said, uh, I love now, I really look forward to the days that we're all together because it's not, uh, it's not every day and it's not um, just because you have to, it's because you want to, and because it's going to be productive, and because you're excited to see your team, because I still like seeing everybody. Um, and so like Chris said, I think that landing on this sort of hybrid model will be different for everybody and every company. Uh, but for us, I, I am amazed at how well our team adapted. I mean, the, the email went out on, I think, a Sunday, and it was a week before everything really shut down. So there was like this week where everything was open, and you were like, oh, there's this pandemic thing, whatever, like, I'm gonna go hang out with my friends and we're all gonna work together because, you know, we get two weeks to not go to the office, it's amazing. Uh, I don't think anybody knew what it was gonna become, uh, but our team responded. Maybe Bill Gates. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I think he did. Uh, but no, our team responded incredibly well and, and we were on Zoom calls the next day and it was, it was as seamless as it could have been, uh, it really was. And, uh, and Chris and Henry, everybody supported, uh, everybody that needed the support, whether it was monitors, whether it was chairs, whether it was you know, 
a desk, and, you know, some people had never worked from home um, at Rockefeller. So, so they really supported the team and, uh, and made the transition really seamless. And, and I think we've landed in a really healthy spot. You need to add to this, Mary? I'll just be quick. I mean, I, I just think that, you know, in the time I've lived here, it's pretty nice to see that Austin used to be the town where these big companies actually put their, uh, you know, sort of less, like, primary business lines here, like the marketing arm or Apple or whatnot. Now, in the last three years, Oracle, uh, we're moving our whole damn headquarters here or, or whatnot. And big companies are making those decisions. Um, so that's good. This is all positive. It's, it's getting more talented people to move to this town. And uh, I think it puts every entrepreneur in a position to really build an amazing team of talented people. So I think that's good, positive. So hopefully we keep going in that direction. We have growing pains like any other city, but um, if we can kind of keep you know dancing this fine line of maybe doing it right and being attractive for outsiders to come in, that that could be a big positive for us. But I'm really proud that we have a company based here. Uh, we don't have all of our employees in Austin, but but I think 16 or 17. We only get together again when needed in meetings and kind of all that. And everyone else has the freedom to work from home and we trust them to do that in the job. Well, I'm, I've only lived here a year and I feel very welcomed in, in Austin. And uh, I think the best is yet to come, right? I think we, it's a great city. And also, there's great surrounding cities that are 20 minutes from downtown, right? So you live in, in a big city, uh, oftentimes the traffic can be a barrier to go do the fun things. I think Austin's extremely accessible. Yeah. Um, so last thing we'll wrap on is, uh, you know, first and foremost, at being in Texas, everyone thinks of barbecue, but I have to ask, number one, one piece of advice for anyone working in a startup, and number two, your favorite breakfast taco in town. <laughs> Favorite is the mm. auto at Taco Deli. Okay. So I don't know if you've had that. Uh, refried beans, sliced avocado, bacon, <laughs> flour tortilla, not corn. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know who started like, putting corn tortillas on breakfast tacos. I don't have tortilla. That's for enchiladas. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I would say listen, and then I wouldn't have forgotten the advice part of the question. <laughs> um, no, I, I think it comes down to one, uh, surround yourself with, with really good people. Um, and, and like Chris said, you know, meet as many people as you can. There's tons of great resources, tons of great uh, places around town to do that. Uh, and then the second one is, is you know, show up every day and, and you do the work and you sit down and you, you just do it. And the highs will be high and the lows will be low, but if you just if you just plug away at it, you know, things will happen and, and things will start moving. And, uh, and you just gotta keep showing up. And if you do that uh, more often times than not, I think you'll, you'll be successful. And so just, just show up. Henry, uh, any last final words for a Q&A? Well, I think just, uh, I think Thomas said this lightly, but just show up, you know, maybe get out there, go do things. There's a lot of really cool free events to, uh, that you can meet people at here in Austin. So you can either choose to be at home by yourself or maybe you can choose to go out and you might meet someone. And at the end of the day, still go home at the end of the night and watch TV by yourself if you choose to. <laughs> so probably what I'm going to do a little bit of, or maybe read is probably more my thing. But, but yeah, just, you know, I met a lot of people in this town, developed a lot of relationships across a lot of industries. I've had corporate life, had a professional services life, and maybe more recently a startup uh, type of life. And you'd be surprised how much overlap there is in those groups uh, and so forth. Pretty strong community here. You just got to get out and go meet them. Yeah, no, I, I love that. Um, any any questions? Yeah, so I'd love if you each could share individually what your favorite alternative asset class that you guys use within non developers. Yeah. Uh, a great question. Do you have any personal favorites? <laughs> yeah, so I like uh, I like doing direct angel investments. Um, you know, because again, I think it's more of a statement that you're you're betting on a person to do great things. Um, and it's not really so much about trying to always make money about supporting someone and, and trying to build something worth making. Um, yeah, to, to Chris's point earlier, the fact that you can now start a company anywhere, um, one of the things that, that I'm really excited about is, I, th I think crowdfunding is really cool. Uh, for people that are not in, you know, maybe hubs that are near uh, big VCs or big pools of money, uh, the fact that you can raise money and probably get a bunch of customers all online I think is really cool, uh, and there's been you know changes in the law that allows companies to raise more to the point where it's actually now an attractive pool of money. You can raise up to five million dollars from non-accredited investors via a platform. Uh, I think that has a lot of opportunity for a lot of uh, for a lot of companies and for a lot of investors. So I think I think we're only at the beginning of, of um, you know crowdfunding as an avenue for investments, but also for companies to get funded. And if you're I can't open my glasses on, so you look kind of young from, from, from afar. No. So like, if you came up sort of in the social media age and you can tell a great story online, Thomas's point about being able to raise, raise $5 million on crowdfunding, that's like a seed round uh, on a campaign. Uh, and so like you can, you can do this now. So I, I like crowdfunding. Me personally, um, I've used it. I've used my own Rocket Dollar accounts to invest in startups, uh, to make follow-on investments in the startups that are doing well. Uh, and then there's a platform in town called Micro Ventures where I was able to buy some later stage private shares for uh, for like basically what not really a startup once they've gotten past Series B if you will but uh, so some later stage private companies in hopes that they'll go public or do something you know um, Stripe I got a hold of a little bit of Stripe that way um, and then I'm at the point now where I'm starting to think a lot more about how to do some real estate also but I'm not gonna. I, I, I look, I'm in management, I don't do any real work, so I'm not gonna actually buy rental properties or anything, so I'd be looking for syndications or uh, real estate investment trusts that are private that you can buy into. Um, we happen to know people, um, so uh, if that's something that interests you, of course, we can put you in touch with the right folks, but I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start doing that sort of next. Any other questions? Sure. Um, so since you deal with a lot of money and this belongs to people and you know they probably have saved it for a lot of uh, yeah. years of their life, did you ever go through any kind of lack of trust issue uh, in the beginning you know since you're a new company out of the block and how did you uh, deal with those issues? How did you build trust? Um, if you can speak to that, that would be great. Sure. Uh, I'll give you a couple things that we did while we put everybody's faces and bios on the website. 
so you can click it and see who we are. Um, and you know, when they call, they go, oh, is that, are you, are, are you Chris? Is that who I'm talking to? That's me. Uh, and they can see who we are. Uh, so they're not sending money to some faceless, nameless people. Um, we put right at the bottom of the page, this website was made with love in Austin, Texas, or something like that. Uh, we picked that up from another startup in town that I thought was kind of cute, cool idea. Um, and then we did put ourselves voluntarily through auditing, so we get audited. Uh, we did a crowdfunding campaign, which means we're a reporting company, so we actually have to file with the SEC. So we actually do these things, almost like we are a large company. And so these are helpful, and we can share those results. Well, for one, the SEC filings are public. You can go download them. Um, the, there's a logo on our website that shows that we've been voluntarily SOC audited, which is like going in for a, a medical exam that lasts five weeks, and they look at everything. Uh, so these things help us build trust. Now, whether or not a customer browsing the website for the first time goes, oh, these guys have a SOC certification, probably not. Um, what I think is helpful for them that the site's well designed, phone number up top. Again, they can see the bios, they can you know, they see our uh, faces for radio. Um, and so I, I think those things are really helpful. There's some testimonials up there. And then uh, they can see that we have investor, investors in the company. So I, I, I think over time, you start to look a, to some extent even a little bit bigger than you really are. It's like walking around with sort of your chest pumped down, but these guys might have some. Yeah, I mean, everything Chris just said is true. And we actually just finished running a, a nationwide study that looked at how uh, people view retirement accounts, alternative investments, but also there was a, a portion of it that asked what would make people feel comfortable in this. And trust was the number one thing, working with a trusted account provider. Um, at the beginning, it was really hard. I mean, people were asking, you know, what happens if you guys go bankrupt? Where does my money go? And, and we had both contingency plans for all these things and answers for all these things. Uh, and, at the, and trust is built slowly, right? So some people have been newsletter subscribers for three years before they bought, before they trusted us. Um, and I think for, you know, trust is built slowly, and I think at the end of the day, it's if you do what you say you're gonna do, and when people see that, uh, they, you earn people's trust, and uh, answering the phone, you know, putting your face up, being accessible, uh, but, it's, but it's slow, and it's definitely, um, something that we work at, because it's people's money, it's people's life savings, it's their retirement accounts. Um, so it's something we take seriously. Yeah, that, that's basically the thing. I mean, we, we did all the new financials, we got a sock on it, and we basically show people that we're the people running the company, not hiding it. That was a big thing. And then all of a sudden, people started opening our average customers, writing $100,000. So that's a much larger account than Chime and Acorns and Robin Again, different demographic, but I think that doing the things to be organized, uh, it's, it's not just looking bigger than you are, but it's actually doing things that bigger companies than you uh, do. Yeah. And you're a smaller organization, good muscle building. Yeah. And alternative investing is also very complicated, and a lot of people also don't do that because it's just so messy. There's just so much paperwork that a lot of people are not aware of. So, and, and you have, I think, three or four of those categories. How did you go about learning each of them, and did you productize all of that to make it easy for your customers? Well, so remember, our thesis was built on that, really, we don't get paid to actually connect our investors to the investments. Usually, they know the investments. They pay us to get access to the money they already have. And they kind of have a general, uh, let's say, inclination for the investments they want to do. So like to Dylan's question earlier, people have a favorite alternative investment. What they realize though is that this is a really big store of long-term money that I have. Now this company is going to let me use it to go into my favorite alternative investment, crowdfunding, private angel investing, real estate, or whatnot. So in a way, we don't people don't pay us to, to recommend investments, but people pay us to actually get access to their own money. Can I just ask one last question? Yeah, yeah. What's the uh, marketing channel that is working out the best for you guys? Uh, of all the ones that you have tried, where are you acquiring the most customers? Yeah, I'll let Thomas just answer real quick. I think I know what the answer is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so one of the channels that's, that works really well for us is, is our affiliate channel. Uh, working with uh, anybody from you know 
content creators uh, that write about alternative investments that maybe review different financial accounts, uh, things like that. Uh, that's a really great channel for us. And actually, uh, one of our best channels is referrals. Um, and that's a testament to our support team, that's a testament to our product team, uh, that people buy this account, think it's cool, invest in something they like, and they talk about it. And uh, and that accounts for, for quite a bit of our business is, is referrals. Um, and that's, that's one I'm actually really proud of because we can talk about it all the time over here, but a referral means that somebody really, you know, had a good experience with you and trusted you and, and you provided. Uh, so that's that's the biggest one that I like, but uh, affiliates are fantastic. We have great affiliates, we've been lucky. Yeah. I, have, I have a question here, quick. Um, I think he actually, did you have a question? Yes. Dave, we can go. Here, can I give you the mic so that everyone can hear? Okay. And then I'll take my question. This is about the marketing. Uh, did you partner up with um, any of these um, e-banking, uh, cloud banking providers like uh, Pfizer, FIS, to do where uh, like you get a rocket dollar into their marketplace and you can uh, like internet buy and invest in uh, um, integrating with rocket dollar, you can instantly get access to like all the customers of that buy. So we're, uh, we just signed a deal with one of those, so that's going to launch later this year. So. Uh, we haven't done that up until now. So remember, that's the other thing too, you kind of have to build your startup to a certain point before anyone wants to partner with you. So you end up tending to get into yeah. relationships early on bad economic terms because remember you had nothing when you approached that potential partner. Now you became a little bit bigger, so you go back to them and you say, hey look, either we're gonna redo this deal or I'm gonna go find a new partner. Uh, but again, channels like that open up where maybe they open up exposure to a seven figure, eight figure number of potential back end customers on this affiliate channel. I think a lot of startups, you know, they do in their pitch before they've actually uh, written one line of code saying that that's the model method, and then they're going to end up dying trying to get that one deal done, uh, and so forth. So we haven't done it yet, but we have signed one, and, and that's coming. And it's very related to the one of the ones you named, but not that exact. Um, there, there, there's this fascinating chicken and an egg problem because when we got started, we wanted to go do stuff like that right away, and we had no accounts. You know, like, well, who are you? Now we have thousands of customers and an enormous amount of assets that have flown through the business. So now we can go to those folks and say, hi, and they're like, okay, sign here. Uh, and so like, it, it changed over time. In the early days, you've gotta figure out a way to hustle your way to getting on the board, put some points on the board so that you can go do stuff like that. We wanted to early on, and it was just, it, it was one of our hypotheses, one of my best guess was like, hey, look, I think we can do some B2B stuff right away. I was a B2B SaaS guy. Uh, and then I got rejected harder and faster than I've ever been rejected in my life. Uh, and we dealt with it, it's fine. And we went the direct to consumer path and the web, web page was up and the phone was ringing. So that worked. And now we're in a position of strength where we can go do some of those things. Uh, so my, my question is, for whomever wants to answer, when you're growing your team, uh, what are some key things you look for? Personally, I like in, in the employee, potential employee. What, yeah, you, yeah. what are you looking for? We look to hire people that are hungry uh, and uh, but probably haven't yet had their moment. Uh, and look, we're full believers in, in delegation and total ownership. And so, if anybody that joins our team owns something, you know, like the, the website or part of the website or this project or that initiative or they do the support on this one project, one part of the product. Uh, and that gives people a chance to shine. Uh, and so uh, that's, re that's really important. And then you gotta have some interest in finance because this isn't like, this isn't like bank accounts and your, you know, your first stock, right? We're, <laughs> we're talking about alternatives, <laughs> cryptocurrencies inside of a retirement account, financial partners that, that, that most people aren't familiar with. Uh, and so like, you gotta kind of be interested in this. Uh, and so that's pretty easy. Yeah, I mean, what Chris said, I think I think having people that that are are excited or hungry and, and you know, whatever their motivation, maybe baby is working at a startup and learning everything that there is to know about, you know, a young company or, or something, but but having that sort of curiosity to wanna to wanna join a team that, that you're not just gonna do one thing, you're gonna have to do a lot of things and and uh, and you're just excited to work hard about it. Like that excitement, you can you can sort of tell uh, it's been my experience that the enthusiasm is there. Uh, so, 
someone that, that is ex seems excited and, and seems curious and wants to learn, um, but also but also wants to work hard, um, is really what I think makes makes a good uh, fit for a for a startup. Um, but yeah, it, it it varies. But we're all personal finance geeks at the end of the day, and that's that's probably the one thing that runs like core through everybody in the company is we all we all kind of we all find this stuff pretty interesting, uh, and we like talking about it, and uh, we like learning about it. So I think I think that's like the one main feature, or not feature, one main attribute that we all have. Chris and I, we like the opportunity to maybe overlook people, right? Because as a startup, you're you're probably not going to go after the master's in computer science, uh, spent 10 years as an engineer at Google to come work for your startup at the seed stage. Um, but you want to find someone that's probably just as talented but never had the same opportunities, you know, didn't get into the right program, right school, and they come up through your organization uh, and they develop within your organization. I think that's the main thing, because that, that's what you're looking for, because those people fit in better, right? Because sometimes you're going to get this big company person coming in, and they're asking you, you, you know, where their admin is or something, right? That, that's not going to work. We've actually turned down candidates that have, you know, over 10 years of experience in engineering management roles that, like, great, this person's a really good engineering manager. It's going to be a terrible engineer for a company. You know, they haven't built anything. Probably really good at going from meeting to meeting, but it'd be hard for them to prove to me that they can build something with nothing. Any last questions? Anybody else? Well, thank you guys for, for your time. Really yeah. appreciated the interview. I think this has been really insightful. Um, we're going to post everything on YouTube, so if people weren't here in person or weren't watching the live stream, it'll be on YouTube. Okay. Um, and we can maybe get some some uh, some good nuggets from it, some good clips. I think you guys covered a lot of great topics. Thank you, Damon. Um, appreciate everybody for coming out as well in person. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. June 8th, we'll be back here with the floor found uh, founding team. Um, they have uh, reinvented the return and resale of big bulk items. Uh, they have a big announcement coming soon that should be uh, out publicly before the event. So that'll be our next event, June 8th, the, the uh, Wednesday, June 8th. Um, and yeah, let's put our uh, hands together with the Rocket Dollar team. Thank you guys for coming. We are uh, doing a little giveaway of Brett Hurd's book, right? Oh, cool. So, Damon, do you want to um, yeah, pull so out of the magic bag? Did your raffle ticket? I, I didn't get one. <laughs> did you get one? That's okay. 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 I'll share mine. I think you snuck in. Yeah.